Thieves of Love. What an interesting title. You see, our theme up here is a heart of love. And God is doing everything and has been doing everything, including sending Jesus to pour out his love to us to redeem us. There's nothing more he could have done and could do. And now we have an adversary on the contrary side of this great controversy who is doing everything he can to confuse and steal the love of God from the world that needs it. That's us. Do we need that love? And today we're going to be talking about what the adversary of our souls is trying to do to steal love in relationships prior to marriage. We talked uh, earlier today about the amazing love that God has for our marriages. Now we're going to talk about what the devil's trying to do to steal, to, to be a thief of real love in relationships among young people today as they're headed in that direction. You see, we live in a time and in a culture that is very aggressively trying to destroy and confuse the language of love. God's intent from the beginning for this earth back in Eden. The adversary is working very diligently, constantly, aggressively, to try to confuse what real love is, trying to confuse that a relationship is between a man and a woman, and in a number of ways, which many of you are well aware of, looking to take this world back to the place that Jesus said it would be like the days of Noah. It would be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We don't need to be too descriptive about what was happening in the days of of Sodom and Gomorrah and the days of Lot. Confusion of every kind. Do we see it happening in the world today? In the last 15 years, and that's nothing special about 15 years, but we've, we've watched this with our young people growing up. Just 15 years ago, relationships were what we would call, at least in the context of family retreat and, and it was family, you know, family camp and family camp meeting, all those as the years went back, 25 years since the first family camp meeting. <laughs> but back there 15 years ago, it was relationships were what we call normal. And you're going to hear us use this word many times today. It was just normal. And we have seen over the last 15 years, while the world and culture has tried to rob, to steal the relationships, normal relationships of love that leads to marriage, on the other side, we've seen movements that the pendulum has swung to try to counteract that, that has taken relationships too far the other direction and has created anxiety in young people today so that, and their parents, parents, so that contrasting 15 years ago when our young people, who are in their 30s now, could be in a conversation with a boy or a girl and nobody thought anything because they were just having normal communication to a time where the confusion that has come on the swinging of the pendulum away from the world's direction, swinging it too far back. Have you ever noticed that when a pendulum swings, it comes up to the end of the the arc, and then where does it go? Stop in the middle? (laughs) It just swings naturally back. And we have watched over the last 15 years that pendulum swing so far back in the other direction that now young people can't even talk to somebody in an auditorium like this if it's a boy and a girl without creating, mom, did you see that? That's not normal. But we've watched this happen. Heard one amen there. Thank you. (laughs) 
But it's true. We've watched this. And again, as we mentioned to you yesterday, our hosts have asked us, the host of each of the family retreats in our planning session in October asked us to specifically talk about what we shared yesterday and what we are sharing today. We're seeking to find some balance between how far the pendulum has swung in the world and how far back we've tried to swing it un unintentionally probably in some ways and to seek for balance. So this is a question for all the unmarrieds here. This morning we talked to all the marrieds in the room. So if you are not married, this question's for you and we want to see a show of hands on this question. How many of you who are unmarried means you don't have a spouse, you don't have a husband or a wife, for those of you who don't know what that means, whatever. How many of you have ever thought you would like to get married? Let's see your hands. Put, put them up high so we can see high. you. We're a long ways away here. Keep them up there. <laughs> we have Thank some half you. elbows here. <laughs> Thank you. You can put your hands Good. down. Thank now, you. I saw a lot of children raise their hands, and that was good. Now, I'm going uh, to refine my question. I'm looking for those of you between the ages of 15 and 30, or anybody 15 and forward, or 15 or more, who are not married, who would like to get married, or think someday you would like to get married. I want to see your hands. The children weren't shy to raise them. Come on, raise them up high. Not just bending your elbow, put it up there. <laughs> okay. okay. There's nothing to be ashamed of. This is good. Even, thank you. Even in this auditorium today, there might be, have been some reservation because, I mean, we shouldn't be thinking about that, should we? Well, why not? Not planning <laughs> your, your marriage, but it, it, there's nothing wrong with having the thought. It's nothing wrong with thinking that someday in God's time, as I get older, more mature, and I have purpose, you know, a direction in life, that God is going to link our life with someone else. That was his original plan in the Garden of Eden. And that pendulum swinging to the other side has made young people almost intimidated to even answer that kind of question. Right. And so we want to kind of open up this topic this afternoon and see what the Word of God has to say and look at some of the ways that we can somehow, and there's, you know, everybody has to find their balance at the cross of Christ. That's where the, the perfect balance is, right? But what is, what is good and right for one young person isn't necessarily the same uh, version picture or version that another young person has because God doesn't make cookie cutter relationships every relationship is unique because it has mm -hmm. two unique people in the equation so there's a, a verse in Psalm 37 verses 4 and 5 I should have had this out here and ready I, I didn't find it for you. that's all right Psalm 37, if you've, if you've got your Bibles or your devices, it says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of what? Your heart. And now, so what's the first thing we need to do to get right desires? Delight ourselves in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your hearts, and commit your ways, in verse 5, commit your ways unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do what? Bring it. He will bring it to pass. So as our young people were growing up, we developed, and I particularly as their father, their dad, developed a, a way that I would reach out to each of my young people. And they all responded well to just walking and talking, or if we're on a drive somewhere, but I made time, probably every couple of months, it was nothing on a schedule, but made time to communicate one-on-one -on -one with each of my young people to strengthen the bond between us. And I remember one day going out for a long walk with our daughter, our oldest daughter, Allison. And we were talking, she was, she was in her mid-20s, and we're walking and talking, and, and I said to her, so are you getting, 
you know, any concerns about the fact that you're not in a relationship and other young people that you've grown up with and you've gone to family retreat, family camp with, they're, they're getting in relationships. And she said, no, no, it's, it's fine. And as we continued the conversation, she shared with me that she's, she's just at rest. I said, that's really a good place to be. She said, I believe that in God's time, that if, if it's his will, and I do believe it is his will, he'll, he'll show me. And I said, so are you praying about it? She said, no, I don't, I don't pray about it. I said, why not? She said, I've just given it completely to the Lord. I said, well, I understand that that's a great thing for you to give it completely to the Lord and be surrendered and be content with such things as ye have. <laughs> you need to be praying about this. And I'm going to ask you to make this a matter of daily prayer. She said, really? I said, yeah, I'm not talking to my 12 year old, I'm talking to my 25 year, year old. I said, yes, because right now you need to be tuning in to God's will for you in your life in this regard in relationships. And sometimes if we're so, so trusting in the Lord that it's off of our our thinking, and it's off of our praying, sometimes we can miss what God is trying to open up to us. And she began to pray that prayer in her own way, in her own time. And when I walked her down the aisle, I'm just gonna tell you this little story. <laughs> when I walked her down the aisle towards her husband-to-be, Alexander, I was so excited and I was not going to give the standard line to who giveth this woman to be married to this man. And I would say, her mother and I do. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. I used to sing at weddings and I heard that over and over and over. And I said to my wife and to my daughter, I said, I'm not gonna just say her mother and I do. I'm going to give a little speech, okay? Because <laughs> I've really put a lot of time and energy and love into this whole thing, and I've got something to say to her, to them, and to him before I hand her off. <laughs> he did the same thing with our daughter Emily as That's well right. a couple years before. Uh, Pastor Powell may remember that. He, he didn't get to speak quite as soon as he was ready because Tom had to say a few words of... That's right. <laughs> Handing off. Can't be preempted by the pastor, okay? <laughs> now, and so, for Allison, as I walked her up that aisle, there was something very precious, okay? She said these words that I just read to you. Father, he has given me the desire of my heart. Amen. That was so sweet, and as I... I had my little, my little spiel up there, it wasn't too long, and I shared, and I handed her off, and I said to Alexander, what I've invested in her and the love that I, th that I have given to her in preparing her for this day, I said, I am taking her hand today and I am giving it to you, and I am entrusting my daughter into your hands and I trust you to take care of her. Is that pretty basic? But that was from my heart to his because God was giving her the desires of her heart. This is what we want to be able to lead our young people toward. Guide, help, encourage our young people to the place where we can hand them off. This isn't a grievous process. Yes, we can miss aspects of having them in the home, but isn't that what life is about? Isn't that what we're doing? Amen. Preparing our children to begin their own homes? Not, you know, oh, this is terrible, and, you know, now you're not going to be in our home. And <laughs> it was a wonderful time. It was. I mean, of course we miss our children, but we're happy to see where they are and to see that God is working in their lives and that God is, has formed a new family with a, a, a purpose to share in his love with those that they come in contact with. And now the Lord is blessing our girls with children and that's a new dimension as well. So we're loving it. Yeah. <laughs> so this, this idea of how do we develop a relationship that is, that is honorable to God 
honorable to the parents and honorable to each other as a young man and a young woman, how do we go through that process? In order to, to discuss that, we want to look at some of the, the pitfalls on either side, okay? One of the things that we want to emphasize here is that guys are going to notice girls. Is that a fair statement? You older guys, you could, this is your, your experience. You should be able to answer that one really simple, right? But even the young ones here, and you know, the, the, while when I was growing up, so I'm going to, this is a story from a long time ago. You know, if, if there's an eight and 10 year old girls and boys, it's like girls are yucky and boys are creepy. <laughs> but that's not the way it is anymore. Because younger and younger and younger, there's a pushing to mix up and confuse the mind of little ones. But it is normal for a young man, especially as they go into puberty, to start all of a sudden recognizing that the yucky girl isn't so yucky after all, right? And he might see something in her that attracts him. That is nothing wrong with that. But it needs to be more than just the outward because the outward can change and it's the inward, the heart, the character that needs to be the focus, not just the external. And so with the young ladies, you know, it's okay if you see somebody who catches your attention and he's, he seems like a gentleman and he seems kind and he seems like he has principles and, and morals and things that you want to be attracted to. There is nothing wrong with that, to have those perceptions. If we don't have those perceptions during these teen and er, teen years, when we get into the age of being out there ready to pick a spouse, we aren't even going to know what to look for because it's been shut down for so long that we're afraid to even entertain those kind of thoughts. So it is normal, but it's not okay to let those thoughts go beyond what you see and appreciate and respect about them in their character or the, even their beauty. I told one young lady, because she was, she was um, in a relationship that her parents were not in agreement with that was not a God-honoring relationship. And, you know, her parents asked us, and she was willing to let us talk with her and her husband-to-be, that was a bit awkward, but um, I, I talked to her, we, we were, as we were sharing with him, I said, God has given you many talents, and you are just on the, just stepping into life, okay? You're just stepping into, you know, the direction God has for your future. And if you make this step that your parents are cautioning you and asking you not to, to take, you don't realize that, that the step that you're about to make is going to change the whole destiny of your future. And so as we talked, I said, is this the person you want to wake up to every morning? And that seems a little bit, maybe, what was the word you used? You were surprised I said it, right? Well, you usually don't say something quite like that. <laughs> Not quite so strange. But here, here she is, talented, super smart, had, had, had goals and aspirations. Yes, and, and a beautiful young woman who had purpose in life, and now comes this guy along who has no direction, has no job, he doesn't take care of himself, he doesn't even comb his hair, and he looks like he spent half the day, you know, just trying to get out of bed by 11. And I said, is this what you want your life to be? Because you have goals and aspirations, he doesn't. You are not equally on the same plane. And it's not just looks, but certainly if one can't even care for themselves, how are they going to care for you and the children? So there is a part to the external, right? We can't deny that. Unfortunately, she made the choice to move forward. And unfortunately, what her parents feared and what we said potentially could happen unless they both had a conversion experience and, and gave their hearts to God and let God make the change, the inevitable happened after a few children. They ended up separating, and there's been a lot of heartache and pain, and he just never would do anything to take care of her. It was just the convenience of having a beautiful, talented woman that he thought would take care of him in his slothful uh, attitude. So part of what happened in that scenario 
is spoken of in Proverbs, the fourth chapter and the 23rd verse. But there's a reason why the wise man counsels us to keep our hearts with all, what's the word? Diligence. Diligence. Children, come on, one child out there can tell me, what does it mean to be diligent? Hardworking, Hard persevering, Good. faithful. Good answer. Love it, doing your best. So let's just put a few of those words in there. Keep your heart with faithfulness, doing your best. Keep it in a persevering way. Keep it for what? Keep it for God. Amen. Keep your heart with all diligence because... Out of it are all the issues of life. And so keep your heart because you have value. This, this young lady that my wife is sharing about here, the tragedy is that this, I mean, there's a lot of tragedy involved in these kind of situations, but she had so clear a direction in her life. It was a God-honoring direction. It was a prayerful and planned direction. And this young man, for, it was beyond us how this worked because we couldn't quite figure it out. Yes, man looks on the outward appearance and God looks on the heart, but we couldn't see anything inside or outside that would cause her to be swept off her feet. But one thing, there was one reason she got swept off her feet. She had pity for him. She felt sorry for him. She wanted to help him. She wanted to take care of him. Now in a group this size, there are young ladies. Because this often happens on the emotional side of life. There are young ladies that have a tendency because they're good hearted. I mean this lady, this young lady was a good hearted, really good girl, okay? But sometimes that can turn into a distortion mm -hmm. <laughs> that I feel sorry for this, this guy. And that really was the bottom line. And he took hold of it. And she got involved in a codependent relationship that was devastating. Not because he was nice looking, not because he had money, didn't have any of that. I mean, not because of providing a nice house, but for one reason. That's the bottom line that we found out later, is that she wanted to help this poor guy. And, and, and she went right into a marriage. So keeping the heart with all diligence is a multifaceted exercise in reality, okay? Because what ended up happening, the first reason that we have here is because keeping your heart keeps your value. She was willing to devalue herself, her dreams, her aspirations, her God desires. Now, she didn't go through and check these things off and say, yeah, I'm letting this go, I'm letting this go, I'm letting this go. She was drawn into it. She was emotionally sucked into it and she went blind. You heard of the rose-colored glasses? We don't usually think of it in this term, but she went blind to all the other things and lost her value to try to give him value. And humans can't do it for humans. Amen. It's God that does that. Our value comes from God, not from one another. Also, keeping our heart with diligence. And we learn that keeping our heart means keeping our mind, right? Keeping our senses, keeping our reason, right? So keeping that means that this here... Our reason, our senses, are the source of everything that we're going to do or say. So that's why it's important that we keep our thoughts, our minds, so that we, the source of what is happening here becomes the expression of what happens out there. So we want to keep our heart with dil all diligence. That means it's, it's going to take some uh, uh, awakening and some working and some perception and maybe some you know, conversations from our parents, even our siblings, to, to keep the course stayed. So we want to know that in the heart, in the mind, is the source of everything we will do. So if we lose our mind, so to speak, 
That's right. If we lose our heart prematurely in a wrong type of relationship, we then will, it will affect everything we do from that point forward. So we want to keep that heart. It's the source. The other reason, the third reason, and there are many reasons, but the three reasons that we're talking about, the third reason is because our heart and mind are constantly under attack by the adversary of our soul. Mm -hmm. If we can help our young people, parents, if we can help our young people from a young age recognize that if they are willing to keep their heart with all diligence, it's not just in the realm of relationships. That's, right. That's what we're focusing on right now. But if we teach them to, how to keep the heart with diligence, it means that they can always go here. They can look at the principles. If they're being attacked, if they're in school and they have somebody say something very bizarre to them that happens today in the school systems, or they can, in the church, it can happen, you know, something that somebody saw at the movies. They can go here because part of the heart keeping is that it's being kept with Christ. Amen. There's a surrendered life when a young person and young, young people, little, little ones, when you love Jesus, okay, you older ones, when you are willing to be surrendered to Jesus, you will be kept by the power of God through faith. Amen. You will be warned by the Holy Spirit. But what happens is if you find yourself in this heart keeping process, if you find yourself starting to rationalize away, and I don't want to talk to mom and dad about this. I don't want to let them know about these feelings that I'm having right now. I don't want to talk about this. I... I don't want to talk to God about this. You can know in an instant, and the Spirit will be calling to you, that you're not keeping your heart with all diligence. You're letting your heart slip away, and you are losing your mind. Losing your mind. Do you understand that? I know that always gets put in a different context, but that's, what, that's how my wife could speak to this young lady is as straight as she did. And it just went right over her because she had lost her heart. She had lost her connection with God. So as, as we said, even in, in good motives, you know, we, I had, when I was single, I had the opportunity to influence somebody I worked with, one of the doctors on our unit. And, you know, he, he was very attracted to who I was, and who I was was because I had Christ in my heart the best I understood. And in that process, I was trying to encourage him to have a relationship with Christ. He would go with me to church, and this was all going pretty well. And then my dad said to me, you need to step out of this picture and allow him to, to if this is his true desire, to move forward in that relationship, in his relationship with God. I didn't like that because I liked him. Your dad was right on target. <laughs> <laughs> so I listened and I'm thankful I made that decision to step aside, to cut, step back from the relationship. And it was evident over a short period of time that his interest really wasn't that solid in the relationship with Christ as much as it was the interest that he had for me. And he even said, you know, if we get married, we'll just, we'll just go to the church you want to go to and we'll raise the kids the way you want to raise the kids. I mean, all that sounds so good, doesn't it? But it's not reality. Mm -hmm. You have so many things that are going to be challenging after you get married. You don't want to add those in because they won't go away. That's right. And we have heard couples that have come to us in counseling where they're unequally yoked and the husband has said, you know, has made these promises prior to marriage and then they're sitting in front of us and they're in terrible marital problems and then he says, well, you know, I mean, I, I, I didn't say forever or I, I just said that because I knew it would make you happy. I knew if I got baptized we would get married and that's really what I wanted. So his heart wasn't really in it. So you cannot be safe in that, that kind of a relationship. You have to step back and let somebody else step in to nurture that person spiritually. If their heart is willing and that's really what it's seeking, then somebody else can be the one who leads them to Christ, right? 
And I also said that to my friend, Tom Waters, a number of years ago, that as he was studying with somebody uh, as a single young man, and he called me up and he would, you know, start talking to me about different things that's going on in this Bible study with a beautiful young lady. Uh, I said, she is not interested in Bible study. She's interested in you. No. I said, yes, she is. I mean, I'd already been through it, right? On the other side of it, I trusted my father. Now I'm passing on, you know, adult wisdom or apparently wisdom or something down to... <laughs> As we were young adult teachers in, in, in our big Sabbath school. <laughs> so I said, hey, just, just try it out. So you step back and offer that, you know, say, I can't do this anymore, but my friend that, you know, from church, she's willing to study with you. How many Bible studies do you think we had together, me and her? Zero. So. You were right, dear. <laughs> Maybe that's why you thought I was smart, huh? That's, that's part of it. <laughs> anyway, thieves of love. So let's go back now to normal, okay? Let's come to normal. Yeah, let's come to normal. <laughs> let's return to normal here, okay? Is it okay for, let's just make it real practical here, okay? So here we got the Williams children sitting here on the front row. Okay, is it okay for one of the Williams boys to go talk to a little girl somewhere in here from another family? Tell me, is that normal? Thank you. When does it become abnormal? 13? 15? See, there's something that happened, and how many of you ever heard of the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye? How many people have ever heard of Vision Forum? Oh, well, that's good. Things are getting better. So we went through this 15-year period that I was talking about, and our young people and us as parents never got drawn in by the I Kiss Dating Goodbye or the Vision Forum movement, okay? It's a patriarchal, it was a patriarchal, it's exploded, and its founder, all this stuff was revealed. But, but here's the deal. A lot of people did get influenced by it. And we know some of the people today at some of our retreats that are still suffering the consequences of this faulty, you know, the, the guy who wrote the book, I Kissed Dating Goodbye, has made a confession. How many of you knew that? Oh, you guys are pretty good. Okay. But it didn't change a lot of what happened. That pendulum swung so hard back that it's created a lot of problems. For example, you went into... Do a young adult yeah. breakout uh, session. So young adults, we're talking 18 to 30. Is it okay that they sit mixed as guys and girls in that kind of setting? Oh, see now there was less, there was less coming back on that. It was okay for the five and six year olds to talk together, but is it okay for the 18 to 25 year olds to sit and talk together? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Yeah. But here they are. They're on two sides of the room. Guys on one side, girls on the other. These are adults, young adults. And who had that assignment? <laughs> Nobody had. The, it's just how a few people can influence uh, a group of people. We have to have our eyes on the Word of God. And a, in the best book we can recommend, other than the scriptures on this topic, is Messages to Young People. It is so balanced in the approach of relationships. And while it is a compilation, and sometimes we can take a few paragraphs and develop a certain idea or idealism from it, we need to go back and read it in its context. Line that's what, upon line. That's what we did in our home. We would see passages, and it's power-packed because it's the punchline of the, maybe the chapter but you need to go back and read it in the context in which that counsel or those principles are brought forward to get the picture. So it's not talking about relationships where they're all over each other and they're inappropriate, you know, uh, touch and those kind of things. But it's also not talking about having guys and girls so that they can't even be on the same side of the room as one another in a conversation or in a meeting. I'm happy to see everybody's mixed up in here. That's good because that's normal. So what happened when you walked into that breakout session? I said, what, what's going on? 
how come all the guys are here and all the girls are here? And I walked across and sat on the guy side and I said, it's okay that we don't have to sit segregated because you're adults. If we don't help our young people in those teens and 20 years, because we don't have a problem when they're little, but if we don't help them to see that it's okay that they can have friendships that don't have to be romantic, that don't have to be, you know, a certain distance apart, they, how are they going to know how to communicate with somebody of the opposite sex when they develop an interest? Because then it becomes awkward because they have never been free to have a normal, friendly conversation with them. Our girls had girl who were friends who were girls and guys friends who were guys. And as they got older and we trusted our girls and we trusted those guys, they could go out and do things together as friends that were fun that we didn't chaperone because they earn trust. They are not looking for a romantic relationship. They're not looking to go out and do something crazy. So trust is very much a part of this. But, you know, one of our daughters, they, they went water skiing uh, with one of the guys and then his family came out later and they were on the lake and they had a great time. Another time they went hiking together and other types of activity, canoeing and, and you know, they just went as friends. All of those normal friendships in your communication and activities helps you to know and how to relate to the one you're going to marry and what qualities that you like in this friend and this friend and this friend. And God's going to bring all those qualities together just in the right package for who is to be your spouse. It won't mean they're perfect, by the way. I want to clarify that. But you will see good qualities in many. And then pull all the good qualities and then somewhere along the line it may be one of those friends down the track but it may be somebody totally different who is a blend of the things that you you respected and appreciated and the and the things you saw that were the qualities that you saw as a christian so i'm going to just give a little contrasting example just so that it's clear for those of you with these young families i'm hoping you haven't even been affected by this but just for clarification this is what I'm talking about on the, on the abnormal side. And this has happened. It has happened in many of our retreats because we seek, wherever we're seeking to follow the will of God and find balance, the devil is there. Culture is always there, but, but the devil is there trying to mess things up. So here's an example that's not normal. Okay? I could tell you uh, numerous examples of this, but so I'm not going to tell you where it happened. Certainly not going to tell you who it was, okay? But this is abnormal. There's a young man and a young lady. Both of their families are present at the retreat. They end up having a spontaneous conversation in the back of the meeting hall in between meetings. Within a few moments, one of the siblings involved in these families ran. Guess where that sibling ran? Any guess? Mom. Mom. Our sister's talking to this guy back in the room. Is there something wrong with that? Why did the sibling run and tell mom? This was not a 14-year-old. Would it have been wrong for a 14-year-old to be talking in the back of the meeting room? See, we're getting, this is where the confusion is. This is the contrasting example. This wasn't a 14-year-old. This was somebody in their 20s talking to someone of the other gender. This is abnormal. Do you hear a little passion in that? Okay, because for a period of time, and it has not gone away in some of our some of our retreats, this is not normal. And what happens is, so some young lady comes walking up to that back door over there, and there happens to be a guy that's approaching too. And the guy opens the door for the young lady, and she walks in, and because things are not normal. She goes and tells her mom, this guy opened the door for me. You think he likes me? This is a real example, okay? It's not made up. I wish I could say I was just making it up. Okay? 
So these are what we call strained ideas. And they create an awkwardness so that we have had young people. I can't tell you how many young people that have come to us privately. And they said, OK, so I, I was just trying to get to know this young person, OK? And he is saying to me, do you think I need to go talk to your dad before I talk to you? That's not normal. He's not asking to marry her. He's, he's just, he just met her at a family retreat. Do you think I need to go talk to your dad to see if I can talk to you? This is confusion on the opposite end of normal. There's confusion over here that we're all seeing on trying to, to make does. all the genders equal and turn maybe have 10 different genders. Now there's a man and there's a woman. There's a boy and there's a girl. That's confusion. But this that I'm talking about is confusion that's happening right, can be happening right in this room with young people saying, so I was talking to this I was talking to this young lady. We were just getting acquainted. And somebody went to my mom and said, is this a new relationship developing here? Is that nice? No. That's pressure. So what's the conclusion the young people think? I better just sit with all the guys. I better not talk to a girl, or I better not let a guy talk to me. Is that normal? No. We, we need to find balance in this. So we're going to look at communication because this is so much a part of any relationship. And there are pitfalls on both sides. He, you just demonstrated the, the kind of pitfall in communication that's strained to trying to keep everything so tightly away from the world that we aren't balanced in the cross. And then there's the other extreme where there's so much freedom and there's so much comfortability, and there's so much forwardness and flirtatiousness and all other kind of things that that also comes into the communication. Right. And oftentimes, young people who are in one side or the other, when they see the folly of one side or the other, they do the flip. They do the pendulum. They Ooh. do the pendulum. And it's not just the young people's fault. This is our responsibility, parents. It's not for somebody else to teach you how to train your children and how to educate your children in these matters. It is for um, you to take up that responsibility and talk about these things. Don't make your child feel or your, your, your teenager feel like they've done something wrong if they're going to be speaking in the back of the room during a break in the meetings to somebody of the opposite sex because it's not a wrong thing. Now, if they're, you know, out of, if their conduct isn't right, that's another issue. That's right. But not the fact that they're just communicating. So today, many people, and I will say it's not guys. I think this is a problem that's even growing out of the male area and becoming more of a female problem, is that there is so much flirtatiousness that happens in communication. You know, the wise man talks about, find that text, I think it's in Proverbs or whatever, I'll find it. Anyway, the, about uh, counsel to a young man about listening to the wisdom of his father. You can read it right there. I still have my glasses on. I think that's it. I've got my mic, thanks. Oh, okay. Is this the one you want yeah. me to read? It's not in our notes, so she's just coming up with this one. Yes, yes, yes. Right here? Yeah. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in your heart, and neither let her take thee with her eyelids. <laughs> My eyelids don't do much, but you get the idea? This is the wise man speaking. Was he speaking from experience? Did he get taken a few times? Like about 700 or something. Okay? <laughs> Took him a while to learn about the... And finally, he just said it was, he summed it all up by just saying it's just all vanity. It's kind of a, what a conclusion to come to. Well, it is. It's all vanity, but yeah. So, yeah, so here we <sighs> see that it's a warning. So young men, you need to pay attention 
because the communication that you're in with a young lady is not just the words that you're speaking, but it's also the aura that she has. And girls today are very aggressive. Hoping it's not here, but it probably is some of it's here. <laughs> girls in the world are very aggressive, but even those girls from conservative homes, Christian homes, have a different type of aggression that is camouflage is the word I'll use, in proper conversation or trying to, to stimulate conversation, generate conversation about topics that are inappropriate that just, when, with just a friend. Like, how many kids would you like to have when you get married? Is that an important question to ask your friend? No, that's, a, that's an important question to ask if you're in a relationship and you're gonna be moving on toward the marriage altar, you better know that you have some kind of harmony on that, right? At least be somewhere you know, in the same uh, direction. No kids, or yes, some kids, and how many? Well, we'll decide that at some point. But this is a way that girls sometimes are aggressive. And we have to be careful, young ladies, that we don't use our beauty or our words or our eyelids or our flirtatiousness because we want to capture his attention. Just be who you are. Don't be somebody different because you want to impress someone. So adults, I just want to just remind you that sometimes we've heard this kind of thing and we've heard it at a number of places. So it's, I'm not picking on any particular place, but we've had parents come to us on several occasions recently, and uh, they would say something like this. Oh, we saw so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so together out in the foyer. Is this the new couple? And we say, we didn't see that. And we don't know if it's a new couple. But don't jump to conclusions prematurely. This is one of the things that can happen on the other side where parents are, are actually creating an environment that either intimidates young people. So if that was you as a young person with another young person and you had two or three parents saying, are you the new couple? Would that make you feel a little bit intimidated about talking to somebody? You were just having a normal conversation. Yes. So parents, we shouldn't be doing this. Neither should we be pushing our young people to get involved in relationships prematurely because we want to live out a fantasy. We have known so many parents who have tried to live mothers out. Mothers primarily. Mothers primarily trying to live out the, the romantic fairy tale that they missed. And we've known several of them that have regretted it with heartache because they pushed their young lady into that. So we're looking for balance. We don't want these thieves of the counterfeits to come in and distort God's plan. Now, we don't have all the answers, and we are not the, the ones to say what is right or wrong, but we are the ones to at least help us all understand that Satan is not asleep. He has so many ways that he can, can confuse the mind of our young people, and all he has to do is get them confused, and they lose track of their purpose in life. They lose track of what God's love for them, and they, they, they're afraid to uh, move forward because they're caught in some of these, these confusing areas. Should I act this way or should I act that way? Should I talk to her? Can I talk to him? Should I tell my parents? Do I not tell my parents? Is it okay to sit by somebody at the meal? I don't have to have girls down one side and guys down the other. All these kind of things are unnecessary for where our young people are when they are of a proper age. We don't see a problem when they're children. But somehow, because they reach a certain age, it becomes a problem. And then after they get past that age, then we expect them to have a healthy, normal, happy marriage relationship. But if they've struggled through their whole uh, acquaintancing years of, of communication and, and friendships and peer relationships, without a healthy balance, then when they get on this side, it's gonna be more difficult for them to experience it. So we're gonna tell you a few things. We don't have all the answers, and we can't put them all in one message anyway. But we wanna tell you that as, as you develop normal friendships, hopefully you're getting an idea of what a normal friendship is. As you develop a normal friendship, you want to 
you know, it's really wonderful if you can be married to your best friend, the person that you want to be able, that you love to communicate with, that you love to do things with. You marry your best friend and you live with your best friend for life and it's the lo- she's the love of my life, okay? That's wonderful, okay? But the way that happens best is being real all the time. That's right. Being real all the time. Unfortunately, I did not do dating right, okay? There's actually nothing wrong with dating. If you look up the definition of dating in the 1828 dictionary, I love to go to that dictionary, and you look up the definition of courting in the 1828 dictionary, I'd rather stay with dating until I get to know somebody. (laughs) Courting is an intentional purpose to pursue to get that woman. That's, That's courting. Dating is an appointment where you meet to get to know each other. Done properly, there's nothing wrong with dating, okay? But be real. I was not always real in my relationships in my wrong days, okay? Let's just say it that way. And I knew how to play the way I was to get the effect I wanted. Is that right? No. Be real. I said to my wife, and I thank God that I, that I had had an experience and a conversion before God brought us together. And I told my wife the truth. And I said, when I knew we were headed towards the marriage altar, I said, I got to be totally honest with you. And there are things in my life, I wasn't the good boy, that you are the good girl, and you need to know all this because it may not be, it may not work for you. And I was totally honest. But I'm talking about when you're getting to know each other, be who you really are. Because I said to, to her, I'd rather you know who I really am. And if you, can't, if you can't live with me now, I mean, if you don't like who I am now, it's better you find out now than before we get married, okay? So let, you, let yourself be who you are. Hopefully, who you are is who Christ is making you. Amen. <laughs> and if that's the case... It's better to be that. We know many girls on the emotional side who have tried to formulate who they needed to be to be who that young man wanted them to be, and it doesn't turn out very or nice. Or who they think, or who who they they think wanted that him he to wanted. Be. Yes, okay, and we've seen that vice versa. But be real and be normal. And don't let relationships intercept your direction in life, okay? This is another important area. Because it's not that you can't have, in fact, the council says, you know, if you are still in your educational process, it's probably better to wait, right, until you get at least through it or close to an end in sight. Now, our middle daughter was in a relationship with her husband now, Isaac, and he was still in school. But that relationship was paced. In college, yeah. Yeah, he was in college. (laughs) And that relationship was paced. And their friendship, it grew out of a friendship that they had. I mean... We were friends with the family, and it's good to do things together as a family. So in these relationships, it's not wrong for young people to have time alone, but it's also very important that they have time in their own homes with their families and that the families learn to interact, and they can really see who each other is. And so she had known Isaac, I think, since they were like five or six years old. And they used to go on bike rides as kids together and uh, in in family groups and, and... the flying fox they did and different things like that they were they were good friends and as their friendship as they got older and Emily could recognize it I think I, she came to Tom one day and she said father I think Isaac likes me and I, I said yeah so I mean they've known each other for years <laughs> no no father 15 years you don't understand I think he really likes me I said oh really <laughs> I mean, he really likes you? Yeah, I think he really likes me. More than being your friend? Yes. <laughs> I said, I get it. <laughs> okay. Remember I said, guys, you know, earlier, guys, we can be clueless sometimes, but I get it. <laughs> so yes. let us into another conversation. Yeah. So We're yeah. running out of time, and I want to yeah. get these okay. things. Anyway, the, the point is, don't lose direction. He finished his education, and, and they planned their future. Yeah, they knew before... He graduated that they were heading to the marriage altar, but all of that was in the plan of their future together. So when we see a relationship bud where it intercepts 
either one or the other's direction and they totally lose direction just to have time in this relationship, that isn't a very uh, s solid sign that, that the relationship is a healthy one. Okay, so really quickly, because we don't want to miss this, all right? Really quickly, if you're in the right relationship, you will never lose connection with your parents. Amen. Underscore it. If you lose connection with your parents, and if you say something like this, oh, they don't understand. They're old fashioned. If they really knew, you are headed down losing your mind. <laughs> That's what it is. That's exactly what it is. We've seen it happen. So if you're staying connected with God and you have a new connection with someone and you, you will stay connected with your parents through that process and they will bless you through that process. Okay? Don't shift your loyalty. I can't tell you how many relationships we've seen that we've been involved in one way or the other with young people and their parents where there has been a shift of loyalty. Whenever there is a shift of loyalty from the child's, the young person's parents to their lover's parents or to their lover, it has always ended badly. Not unrecoverable, but in every case that we know, it has always ended badly with scars, broken relationships that had to be repaired over years of time, and it's, it can be a real tragedy. I'm thinking of one, and I'm not gonna, we don't have time to tell you, but one that just happened recently. So if your young people begin, you young people start shifting loyalty away from your parents to somebody else, somebody you care for, or their parents, it is another red flag. And number three, be honest with yourself and your parents all the time. Be honest with yourself and your parents. And if your parents say something to you like, this doesn't seem right. Why does she do this or why does he do this? Don't be so quick to defend that. Hear what they're asking you because your parents know you better than anybody else in the world, including this guy or girl that you're, you're enjoying. Parents, really quick, three things. You wanna, no, you three, three things. Don't micromanage your children. If you have done your job, if we have done our job, we are preparing our young people day by day, year by year, getting them to the place to be independent in the proper way. Not independent from us or from God in a negative way, but independent in their, their starting their own life, their own home, and that's normal. Don't micromanage. Number two, don't be passive. We've watched parents who are so passive, so uninvolved, that they give their young people no needed guidance at the most critical time, making one of the most critical decisions that will change their life forever. And they're passive about it. Oh, honey, just do what you want to do. And those things have ended badly too. So don't be passive. And number three, we mentioned this earlier, do not try to live out a missed opportunity or fantasy that you missed and try to roll that over onto your daughter. It usually happens to daughters. And from, it, mothers. from mothers. Don't, you don't want to do that. So be sensitive to those thieves of love. And the most important thing is, is that we want to focus on his heart of love and be grounded in his word that will guide us and give us wisdom. And then we can open up these conversations and discussions in our families. I do have to say one other thing. <laughs> Just thought of this. This is a very broad one, but a very important one. There is a time that a noble young man should approach the father of that young woman whose heart he has become aware wants to be more than a friendship. You don't have to go talk to the dad just to get acquainted, hear it. This is my opinion. I hope your parents don't mind this. You don't have to ask permission to just talk to somebody here. But if, if that talking has led you over time in prayer, has led you to the place where you feel like this is more than a friendship. This may be the person that God wants me to be with for the rest of my life. It's time if you're having those thoughts. It's, it's, it's time for that conversation between a noble young man and the father of that young lady. 
to find out if he's okay with that being pursued and then moving forward under the blessing of, of all parents involved. So we're going to take a few minutes to contemplate what we've shared and then the Spirit will guide and lead you individually where your needs are and then we'll come back and close with prayer. Shall we kneel together as we pray? Father in heaven, what a beautiful privilege you made us to be in companionship. You said it's not good for man to be alone, and that's never changed. We thank you, Lord, that you want to guide us, that you want to help us navigate through. And I pray for each young person here. I pray for the parents here that, that are a part of helping the young people to make decisions and, and find balance in friendships and getting to know someone special that would lead one day in accordance with your will to a lifelong union. Father, we just pray that you will give the guidance, that we will be willing to hear the guidance, and that we will recognize that when we are resistant to the guidance, something is not right, and that we would come back to trusting our hearts to your heart of love. In Jesus' name, amen.